Radio IMWS. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and welcome to radio to the election special on Radio IMWS. Uh, broadcasting live from the Al Hikma Center in Batley, West Yorkshire. Now then, um, over the past few months, we've been inviting local candidates into the studio to give you, our listeners, an, op- an opportunity to ask the questions which matter to you. It's a slightly different election special tonight, uh, but I dare say uh, it will give a real insight into the job itself, I'm sure. Um, but first, uh, a warm welcome to my co-host, Mr. Ayub. Bismillah, Ayub. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh, Muhammad, and all our listeners. Yep, and I think the impartiality today, uh, we can win. <laughs> Just thinking <laughs> about waver. that, because every election special so far, yep. at the beginning we made the announcement that we'll be very neutral uh, and will not favour any particular party or an individual. Yeah. But tonight, uh, I think it's not a matter of uh, being neutral, but uh, a matter of being uh, celebrating uh, somebody's yep. achievement. I think it is indeed. And our guest this evening is a man who joined the Labour Party in 1966, age 19. Uh, he served as a Cleckheaton councillor during the 1980s, held the post of the deputy leader of Kirklees Council. Um, but most of us will uh, more readily recognise him as the longest serving Batley and Spen MP. It is, of course, the very popular and now former MP for Batley and Spen, Mr. Mike Wood. Mike, good evening and thank you very much for joining us us on election special. Good evening, Ayub and Mohammed um, and listeners. It's my pleasure to be here. That's brilliant. Now then, um, before, okay, right, uh, today is going to be slightly different. We've got the whole script upside down today because it's Mike. <laughs> um, you can call, give us a call on 01924505629. We do like all our listeners out there to participate. Um, if you do have a question, if you do want to send a message today, um, you can do so by text or WhatsApp on 07460809218. Now then, Mike, we just mentioned there joining the Labour Party at the age of... 19. Now, uh, how did all that come about and why the Labour Party? I was uh, born into a working class family. Uh, and so if I was going to be active politically, it was the Labour Party, which was the obvious vehicle uh, for that. Um, I'd been quite active actually in my local church uh, and ran youth groups for the local church. Uh, which is why I didn't actually get involved in active politics until I was 19. Otherwise, Mm. I think I would have joined the Labour Party when I was 15, uh, which was uh, the age at which uh, uh, you were able to to join. But uh, so it it seemed quite obvious to me that that, uh, if I was going to be politically active, um, then the Labour Party was the uh, the party to to join. Goodness me. Yeah, I mean, Mike, uh, what made you interested in, in politics in the first place? I was interested because, through my parents really, who weren't politically active, but I saw my parents as being representative of a large percentage of the population in this country. Both of them had been fought during the war. My father was badly injured during the war, um, so prepared to give their lives to to the country. Um, Worked um, impossibly hard. My father worked in an iron foundry. Um, my mother was a school cleaner. Um, they were the kind of salt of the earth, I think, mm. is the description that would be uh, would be attributed to them. And yet, in terms of the consideration that was shown to those kind of people, people doing those kind of jobs, was absolutely nil. Um, and it seemed to me that we could achieve a better kind of society where, which was more inclusive and where people's worth... Um, was m- more acknowledged across the board. Politics seemed to me to be a means of changing uh, things and changing things for the better. And 50 years later, I still believe exactly the same thing, that politics like religion are the kind of areas that, um, when you get involved in them, they do have the potential, as I say, to, uh, to change things for so the better. Who are the politicians uh, that's, that have inspired you over the years, uh, Mike? Well... Um, I've not. I'm not in, influenced in a sense by by sort of you know the famous. Um, although I have had a a, a, a a few personal heroes. I mean, I Tony Benn has been really the uh, person I've um, looked to most over the years within the Labour movement. Um, but it's it's uh, it, it's the 
the collective idea, the idea that together we are better when we work together, when we work as a team. Uh, so it's that kind of ideological um, position um, and a fairer uh, kind of society, a society which is less hierarchical, um, where the rich get richer and the poor um, just uh, make do with uh, what they can. Um, it's that kind of I idea, really, which is, is more important to me rather than individuals. And obviously you've been very active uh, locally before you became an MP yeah. as a councillor for Cleckheaton, and that's where I first met Mike, uh, and yeah. that's uh, you know, a friend of Z's as well. I was in our studio tonight, yeah. uh, and I remember, I think we were actually just starting off uh, producing ours at that time, yeah, uh, the monthly newspaper, yeah. and I know you were... So in somewhat involved with the other magazine, Spark, yep. uh, who'd been actually going on for, for a few years before us. Uh, and I think that's where I recollect, recollect meeting you the first time. Yes. And I remember, I think you were the, one of the first people to write into ours, congratulating us on our first issue. Uh, it's going to be very reminiscent tonight. <laughs> to now. Well, well I, I certainly have not forgotten meeting yeah. you at that time. I certainly forgot <laughs> writing <laughs> at the time. We've had the likes of uh, Eric uh, Lawson Indeed. and Max and... Uh, that's, that's right. Uh, uh, what, that, even that's right. Uh, yes. she, uh, Councillor Sheard as well at that time. Uh, mm. Yes, although I think mm. he was a bit of a lesser light, really, in, in, uh, <laughs> in, in the... Up, there were 12, 12 of us uh, who started a community magazine, mm. uh, community paper, um, as you say, called Spark, uh, and we were very pleased when uh, I think your, you and your colleagues approached us uh, saying mm, you wanted, right, to, yes. wanted to start a, a, a mm. new magazine, a new paper, and we were delighted mm. to do what we could to help. It was particularly a difficult time for, definitely for our Asian community at that time. You know, we didn't have a, a serious voice anywhere, yeah. uh, and you know, the local press was quite... Uh, negative about uh, you know the, the, the Muslim and the Asian community and that's how our sprung up. I mean what's your recollection of the eighties, you know, what sort of uh, times were there and how do we compare to what's happening in politics nowadays? Well I think I think locally, um, as you say, um, we were suffering from uh, what was beginning to be a kind of backlash. Uh, in community relations. Um, I was a councillor in, in Spen Valley. In Spen Valley we essentially had I think 150 Muslims. So mm. uh, the Muslims that, uh, that were there uh, were not numerous. Um, I wasn't greatly involved with, uh, with Batley. Um, and uh, until I, actually I think when I got on the council and of course Batley is the second largest Third largest town in uh, in in the, in the community, uh, in the, in the authority. Um, but uh, certainly, um, I th my view is that's the uh, transformation that's most obvious is the transformation within the Muslim communities, uh, from where we were in the eighties yeah. uh, to where to where you are now. And and I think I M W S when when you when I come onto this campus uh, and I see the uh, the extent not just of the of the of the fabric the building mm. uh, but the uh, the uh, range of services and the range of uh, activities I think this highlights a community which is a central to the life of Batley but also very much on the up now in the 80s as you said mm. I'm not so sure that was that was the case um, uh, so I think the biggest transformation has been Muslims helping themselves actually organizing themselves um, making their lives here better, making themselves more central to the, uh, to the, to, to the, to the life of the town and the community, um, uh, perhaps in lots of ways, almost without a lot of help from outside. You know, so. how, how do you think politics evolved locally you know, over the years? Um, well, I have quite strong views, really, that, uh, that local councils um, are going backwards. Um, and they're going backwards in this way. When I was a councillor 25 years ago, um, it was quite clear that there was a process by which I as a councillor, in, in fact it's interesting, I stood as a, as a council candidate in 1980 and beat a uh, fairly long-standing 
uh, Conservative, a man called Walter Walls, whose widow wrote to me this week saying, uh, thank you mu very much for all you've done. I didn't like you at the start because you, <laughs> you threw my <laughs> husband off the council. <laughs> but, you know, etc., etc. So uh, I think that uh, we uh, had a situation nonetheless. When I got on the council, it was quite clear. I had made promises to the electorate. I sought to um, realise those promises by virtue of working through the council process, which involved 20-odd thousand employees. And it was quite clear, although we had an adult relationship, that we employed those people on behalf of the electorate. And what that meant was, if I didn't do what I said I was going to do, if the Labour Party didn't uh, um, produce it and didn't make good on its promises, people could throw us out. Mm. Three years out of four, they could throw us out. Now we have a situation, I fear, where councillors have deferred all of that to officers. Uh, now, the, the, the really poor thing about that is that if I'm an elector and I think the councillor hasn't done what I, they said they were going to do, I can't throw that office around and <laughs> don't employ them. So I think we've got a very silly situation at present where, where the, the, the tail is wagging the dog. Mm. And I think it's bad at all, all kind of levels. Now, against the, against the present background, we, of course, we've got a government that actually wants local government, is essentially mm. strangling local government, uh, and an authority like Kirk Lees to be told you're going to lose £150 million pounds out of your budget, almost at a stroke, almost at a stroke, um, then, of course what that forces them to do is to make very difficult decisions on behalf of the government. Mm. Because these are decisions they wouldn't have taken uh, voluntarily, and they don't take voluntarily, but if, say, if you lose 150 million out of your budget, then you, you're obliged to uh, make difficult decisions. And I think uh, if we have another five years of that, essentially we'll have no local government in this country. Mike, just, I mean... Uh, yeah, uh, if I, yeah, sorry. just want to talk a little bit mm. about the Labour Party, the mm. present Labour Party. Yeah. I mean, I quite remember vividly the night that you were first elected, 1997, I believe. It was. Yeah, I was at the counter. I'm not sure if you were as is. Uh, and it was early, you know, the early hours of the, the night, I think, when we heard the news. The early hours of the 2nd of May, Absolutely. 1997. Uh, it, it was one of the mm. best moments, uh, you know, for Bhakti and Spen uh, after a long period of, uh, you know, Tory government. Uh, now, everyone had high, high hopes from the Labour Party. Uh, what do you think's happened? Is the Labour Party still the same as it was then, or has it changed? Um, well, it's obviously changed, um, and, uh, but it, it changed actually before 1997 mm. with with the uh, assumption of leadership um, of Tony Blair. Uh, and Tony Blair, in my view, um, was in the wrong party. I don't think Tony Blair was ever... Uh, anything other than a very conservative person. It just person. happened to be at the right time at the right place. Right time at the right place yeah. to, to, to lead a party. Because uh, yeah. he took over after the sudden death of John Smith. Indeed. You know, in 1994, around that time. Yeah, yes. Who I think uh, you know, made the party electable. Mm. John Smith had a mm. big part to play in mm. that. Mm. Uh, it was sad uh, to see him, uh, well, uh, mm. so him pass away so suddenly. Yes. Uh, and I think that changed uh, the, the canvas of the Labour Party totally. Yes, it did. So, so the party had changed in many ways before 1997. But nonetheless, as you get closer to an election when you've been out of power for 18 years, I think it's possible for you to not place as much importance with your misgivings about that as you might otherwise do. Mm. Um, uh, so, full of enthusiasm for a new Labour government, uh, which we got in 1997, but it was apparent from very early on that this was not a Labour, Labour government in the sense that any of us in my lifetime had ever mm. um, seen, really. Um, and uh, so um, it was necessary, f I thought... Um, very quickly to um, try and challenge quite a lot of the um, policies of that government. Um, as you know, I was, for the whole of the 13 years that Labour was in power, I was one of the 12 most rebellious um, Labour MPs. I didn't seek to, to do that. I didn't work for 18 years with other people in the Labour trade union movement to get a Labour government only to go to London to vote mm. against it. But on the other hand, if the, if the Labour government that I've worked for, like everybody else, puts before the country and before 
MPs that they want to support it, policies um, such as um, uh, reduction in uh, benefits for the poor, um, uh, tuition fees f to, for universities, and, and ultimately, of course, the ultimate uh, invasion of Iraq, then I'm not going to vote for it. Um, and so uh, it's undoubtedly the case that the Labour Party ha was changed dramatically by, uh, by Blair. And you know that Mrs Thatcher said her greatest achievement <laughs> was New Labour. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So, yeah. uh, and so, of course, the party's changed uh, uh, dramatically. And that's why now we have so much difficulty with the electorate saying to us, well, you're all the same mm. uh, and can't tell the difference between you. And why, of course, now we have uh, a splintering of the Brit British political uh, scene such that um, the two major parties that we would normally talk about, who in uh, 50 years ago uh, would get 80 to 90 percent of the vote at any general election, who at this general election, uh, as it stands at present, will be looking to get 50 percent. So, in your view, how does Ed Miliband compare to Tony Blair? Well, I think Ed Miliband is, is a a uh, different animal altogether. Uh, I've got a lot of time for Ed Miliband. Um, I think he has uh, problems, presentational problems, um, and I think the people around him could be helping a lot with that. But I think, t I think he's a decent man. Mm -hmm. I think he's an honest man. And I think, he, I think he does want a fairer and better society. Um, and I think he will um, adopt... Uh, policies to achieve that which are more in line with what many of us would consider to have been historically you know in, in tune with what you would expect from a Labour government and not from a Conservative one but we've got a long way to go um, and as you know in, the, in terms of the mm. opinion polls um, it's neck and neck, it's neck, and neck. It? yes yeah. OK, uh, and now then, we're just coming up to the first break of the evening. Um, this is election special. Today, our special guest is Mr. Mike Wood. And if you want to get in on the conversation, then you can text the WhatsApp is on 0746080921818. Or you can give us a call on 01924505629. We are going to take a very short break and we will be right back with you. Stay tuned. Don't go anywhere. Back after this. Online and on your home receiver, you're listening to Radio IMWS. Join the Women Only Over 50s Elderly Lunch Club every Monday from 12pm till 3pm at the El Hikma Centre. Enjoy a meal in the company of friends as well as gentle exercise routines including the use of treadmills and exercise bikes. That's the Over 50s Elderly Lunch Club every Monday from 12pm till 3pm at the El Hikma Centre on 28 Track Road, Batley, WF177 AA. For more information, call 01924. Four five double zero triple five. Reach your customers through our radio, magazines and website with competitive rates, advertising on radio IMWS, Pegam, Unnisa and the IMWS website could give your business the boost it deserves. For more details, email info at imws.org.uk or call 01924-500-555. It is related by Sayyidina Anas radiallahu anhu that the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, When a man marries, he has completed half of his religion. So let him fear Allah regarding the remaining half. The Al-Hikmah Nikah service launched by the IMWS aims to introduce prospective marriage partners to help fulfill this important aspect of faith. The service is open to unmarried Muslims who are permanent residents of the UK. For more information, visit our website at www.imws.org.uk Radio IMWS Welcome back to Radio IMWS, broadcasting live on this Friday, the 3rd of April. Uh, oh, the time does fly when you're having fun. Um, it is the 3rd of April. It is a Friday night. It is past, uh, sorry, 8.21 on the clock on the wall. That means it is, of course, election special. Um, we've been running these shows over the last couple of months uh, and we'll continue, inshallah, right up to the election. Today, our special guest is the, and I have to say this with um, a heavy heart, Mike, I do have to say, the former Batley and Spen MP. Um, Mr. Mike Wood. Um, Mike, I want to actually go, I don't know where you've taken you, but I want to go back a bit. Uh, you first stood in a general election uh, in 1993. Is that, am I right on that? No. 
No, no, oh, goodness <laughs> how, me. How first started in 1987? 1987, my apologies. Election, yes, yes, right, yes. yes. Um, uh, that was for, remind me again, sorry. I stood for Hexham in Northumberland, which is just about the only non-Labour uh, seat in Northumberland at the time. Right. I had a fantastic campaign, which lasted 12 months. I drove 26,000 miles during that 12 months. Um mm. Uh, we started a new branch, we got 50 new members, and on election day I got beaten by 18,000. <laughs> <laughs> and so that, that, that's what that was, was right. my introduction to parliamentary politics. Right. Yeah. And then was 97 then your, uh, the second time that you stood? Did yes, you? I, didn't, uh, I didn't stand at the 1992 election right. um, for a variety of reasons. Yeah. Um, and uh, so 19, I got selected by uh, the Labour Party in 1995 mm. here in Batley and Spen, which course in my home seat where I lived um, to, to stand in the next election which proved to be in 1997. Right and how was that campaign? I mean was it again um, similar to the 87 one or? Uh, well it, it had a much better outcome <laughs> from my <laughs> point of view obviously but uh, um, I mean I worked uh, seven days a week for two years yeah. um, even though Batley and Spen was the ninth most marginal seat in Britain. Mm. Mrs. Peacock had held Batley and Spen from 83 when the seat yeah. was formed, when yeah. the, boundaries, the boundaries were changed, uh, until 1997. Mm. I knew that if we did the work, that we should win. Mm. Uh, not because you take anything for granted, um, but uh, essentially um, I knew that it was a Labour marginal seat and not a Tory marginal seat. Right. Um, so I, I was convinced that if we did the work... Yeah, um, we should win, which is essentially is what happened. Yep, and you've defended the uh, the seat on three occasions since. So there's four uh, elections you've won on Batley and Spen. You've yes. un- undefeated, in all in all truth. That's right. And you've always managed to get more, uh, well, over forty percent. And in fact, actually, on one occasion, I think it was about fifty percent of the vote. Um, what's the What's the secret to a successful campaign? The uh, the the, seat, the secret to a successful campaign. Um, if if it's not your first campaign, the, mm. the secret in 1997 was to do the work. Yeah. Um, after 1997, you've something of a record, haven't you? Mm. Um, so it's not you're not going to the electorate saying um, this is what I say I'll do, um, although you might be doing that. But at least then the, the electorate has something to gauge you by in terms of whether you actually yeah. keep your promises and do what you say you mm. would do. Um, so I think the successful elements to campaigns are that you need five years hard work before it Mm. uh, and then a campaign that um, is organized enough to deliver your vote on the day so in in a sense it's as as simple as that Um, but um, the reason that we have got the Labour Party has got um, twice what it should do in terms of um, majority in the last two general elections in my view is because of the work that we've done over the previous 10 and Mm. 15 years and when I say we I mean we uh, what I really mean is the work done by my office Mm. uh, and my six staff because I think it's that's the basis on which people say well um, I might not agree with Mike Wood uh, I might not be a Labour voter but you go to his office People treat you with respect. They go the extra mile for you, mm. uh, and they'll do what they can to help. I either here for the people who should be here for. That's the people who elect them, not yeah. for the Labour Party, uh, not for the government, mm. uh, not for anybody else, not for Mike Wood's career, yeah. but for the people of Batley and Spen. And I think that on that basis, um, you would expect to win. Um, right. uh, without, in, say, in any sense, taking anything for granted. Mm. I mean, in '97, I mean, uh, um, I'm the youngest person in the room by the, by, by the looks of things. Um, <laughs> so, in '97, what were the big issues? It, oh well, we'd had 18 years of uh, Conservative government, um, and uh, the it, if you, if you, again, the other people in the room will remember 1992 when the expectation was that Labour were going to win, and in fact, mm. the, just about everybody believed that Labour mm. was going to win, in, in, including John Major, the Tory Prime Minister. Yeah. Um, and uh, just at the very last moment, it appears that the electorate couldn't just bring itself almost in the in the in the, in the electoral booth yeah. uh, to vote uh, to vote Labour in enough numbers. Yeah. Uh, and uh, John Major got another five years. But by 1997, the the, the mood for a change was almost unstoppable. Mm. Uh, and my argument with a lot of the Blairites within the Labour Party has been that the, the argument that Blair won, won for us in 1997 
we could have won in 1997 with me as the, prime, as a, as, as the leader of the Labour Party, <laughs> with Mickey Mouse as the leader of the Labour Party. The British electorate were absolutely desperate for a change. Uh, and so uh, it's, uh, those, I think the issue was really around the, the, the real wish for a change, mm. uh, basically. All right, okay. Um, we have got a message that's come in. Um, and if you do want to send in a message, uh, the number is 07460809218. That's for your text or WhatsApp. You can give us a call on 01924505629. We do in the, have in the studio with us Mr. Mike Wood. Um, and now then, uh, okay, Assalamu alaikum. Brilliant program. Sorry. Brilliant program. Best wishes, Mike, on your retirement. You've been a fantastic MP, a truly selfless politician, always putting the electorate first, a proper and true socialist. Sadly, not many of this ilk left anymore, Uh, even in the Labour Party, even in the Labour Party. Do you think they are disappearing fast? Who should I vote for? Does the new Labour, uh, sorry, does the uh, new Labour have the same socialist principles that it once prided itself with? Three questions there, Mike. Do you think they are... Well, <laughs> yeah. <quite interesting. laughs> first and foremost, first and foremost the, yeah. the, of, uh, just another voter who, who does like you. And um, But the question said, do you think they are, to, uh, sorry, the uh, so- socialist values are disappearing fast? I think that um, these things are cyclic. Mm. Um, and I, what I think is to every action, there's a reaction. Um, and I think that um, people are politicised by the way life treats them. Mm. Um, and so I think that the uh, the number of poor people who have been ground into the dirt by this present government for five years, mm. there will be a reaction. Mm. People will look for an explanation for why they should be treated like that and what the alternatives are to change it. So I think uh, the... I mean, the Labour Party has never been a revolutionary party, but it has always been a party um, based in part on, on socialist ideals. Right. And I think... Um, uh, the leadership of the Labour Party is a, a, a in a sense, almost a different, uh, a different thing from that. Um, but I think there is still that um, current of socialist ideas within the Labour Party, uh, and I, you know, hope that will always uh, remain so. Um, in terms of who people should vote for, I, of course, am a Labour Party member of 50 years standing, and of course, I expect and hope that people will vote Labour. But that is not to say that in the Labour Party we assume that anybody's vote uh, is in the bag yeah. um, unless we can establish a relationship of trust with that voter. Mm. I think elections are won one vote at a time. Yeah. Um, and I think that uh, I think we should hold this seat yeah. on this occasion. Um, but it's probably the most difficult election in my lifetime to call. UKIP will take votes from both the Conservatives and Labour in mm. Batley and Spen. The big decision and the big issue is how many it takes from each. Mm. So you've got issues like that, which we've never had um, really before. Yeah. Um, the, lib- the Liberal vote, which is eight, seven or 8,000 in round figures in the last two or three general elections, where's that going to go? Because I expect the Liberal vote in Batley's Pen to shrink to 2,000. Yeah. So where's the, where are those 5,000? Are they just going to sit at home or are they going to come out and vote Conservative or... Or for UKIP, even. Mm. Um, so I think that it's not uh, not an easy one to call. Um, but I think Labour. I mean, the Labour Party seems to me um, in Batley and Spen to be uh, of the six declared candidates. The Labour candidate seems to be the only one doing any work. Mm. I may be misjudging things, but from what I perceive, the Labour Party is the party that's working now. Um, if they won't work before the election, you can be sure they won't work after the election. And so, so if work is the determinant, which I think it yeah. often is, uh, and work is a thing by which you should judge yeah. candidates and parties, then I think at this stage the Labour Party probably deserves to uh, yeah. uh, to win. But there's still a long way to go. Yeah, I mean, in the general election, you do generally have, uh, people are always looking towards a government as well as the candidate themselves. Yes. Now, the thing is, um, between the, th- the, th- the three main parties, the Labour, Conservative and, and the Lib Dems, uh, has the gap closed um, well, I, th- I, I think we're looking at a situation where it's difficult to believe 35 days away or whatever it is, almost 35 days away from the election, that any of the major parties is going to have a, an overall majority. Mm. Uh, but a lot could happen between now and then. Now, if not, then uh, there's a whole series of possible scenarios yeah. um, where you could have a minority government. Yeah. 
Uh, that is the, the, yeah. the party with the biggest number, but not mm. enough to form a majority government, being allowed to govern by some kind of association with some of the other smaller parties. Um, or you could have another coalition. Mm. Um, or we could be looking at another election within the next 12 months. So not one election, but yeah. but two, because the five-year um, parliament will not, will not withstand a minority government that loses the, the uh, confidence of the House of Commons, right. i.e. Uh, enough, enough opposing votes to say we no longer have any confidence in you. So, uh, so any number of, uh, of possible scenarios, I think. Right. Okay. Just to pick up on one of your earlier points, uh, Mike, mm. uh, uh, about the socialism within the Labour Party, and in terms of uh, social justice in particular, uh, I remember somebody commenting not long ago about some of the smaller parties like Green Party, for instance, and the SNP having, you know, the the ideal uh, and the philosophy that Labour should have. Uh, and I dare say it may actually draw people towards that, you know, especially those people who believe in who believe very strongly in social justice. Uh, if they don't see that, you know, within the candidates in the Labour Party, then it's possible they may be swayed. The other point, I think, in Baton in Spain is, you know, we've got a nation candidate uh, uh, fielded, fielded by the Tory party, and that may have some implications in terms of uh, the votes uh, that might be attracted, uh, you know, by the Asian community. It's undoubtedly the case that um, some of the smaller parties are more radical than the present Labour Party. I think we have to... Bear in mind that neither of those parties, well, well, certainly, certainly the Green Party has never been in government, uh, and um, it, so there is a sense in which a lot of your radicalism has to be um, tested when you actually have to grapple with um, governing, uh, and so. Uh, but that's not to say that we shouldn't take on board, um, in my view, um, uh, a good part of that um, uh, radicalisation. Um, and um, it was interesting to me in the recent poll in the, the Muslim News that 20% of Muslim uh, readers said they would vote Green. Um, so I think, you know, within, within uh, our own uh, communities, uh, these um, uh, true truths are beginning to be realised and, 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 and if the major parties don't, don't to pick that up I think, you know, as you say they'll, they'll, electorally um, this will cause some problems. Um, the SNP of course is in a different position where they, ha where they are in government in Scotland um, but I, I think the more cynical of us might say that again, what you get from an SNP government is not quite what you might get from the, I mean they're very um, uh, uh, professional and very talented leader. I mean, uh, for, th for those of us who Anorak who watched the leaders debate last night, uh, um, I mean, I think you know the SNP leader was was at least shoulder to shoulder with the you know the major mm. party leaders. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, yes, yes, there are, uh, of course it's true that uh, the some of the smaller parties uh, have uh, a, a much bigger priority, greater priority for social justice, and I think the Labour Party um, has to take note of that. In terms of the local um, selection of candidates, I, I, I assume the Conservatives selected um, a Muslim. And a Gujarati Muslim, uh, that, in the in the hope that there would be a trade-off, because they'll certainly lose some votes. They'll lose some Tory votes, mm. uh, uh, um, uh, people who won't vote for a Muslim. Uh, so they'll lose some votes. Um, but on the other hand, I guess they thought they would pick up um, some uh, Muslim votes from Batley, uh, where they normally um get about 10 percent of the of the vote so uh, I, I guess there was a trade-off uh, mm -hmm. there in their mind um and nobody knows i think how you know that will work out until we till we see the results on, uh, on the within, 7th. within the membership of the local labor party i know there is some disillusionment amongst the asian members of the labor party primarily because uh, of the all women women selection process uh, which I totally agree with. I think uh, you know, I? we should have uh, an equal, uh, or as many women uh, MPs as possible. But at the same time, I think Labour Party doesn't seem to be doing enough to attract 
Asian people to actually become MPs. Now, that's going to cause a bit of a vacuum, not possibly in the short term, but definitely in the long term, uh, if nothing changes. Yeah. Uh, All Women Shortlist. um, Mike, if I can... uh, um, Sorry, uh, we've got a question come in, Hmm. which is about All Women Shortlist. Um, It asks, uh, do you think... (laughs) It is. Do you think Women Only Shortlist is a good idea, as in some areas it has produced not very good women candidates? Um, All Women Shortlist is a short-term palliative... Uh, a short-term means, mechanism, to overcome uh, the uh, disadvantage that women patently serve, uh, patently face in the selection process. So the Labour Party 20 years ago um, resolved that they would use this mechanism um, in winnable seats, uh, particularly, um, to ensure that we got more women into Parliament. Mm. The idea that it's producing poor women um, is um, difficult, I think, to sustain when you compare it with the some of the men that are, are thrown up by the, by, by the open process. Right. <laughs> and so there are some poor women uh, candidates coming through, but there's some poor men as well. Li- and, and so I think, I think that um, what what I mean, if we're getting into into, into kind of Labour Party uh, procedure, um, our problem is that we impose it from above in situations where it is not appropriate. Mm. So I think that Labour Party has to be much more sophisticated um, in terms of uh, the way it's used. Um, and so, for instance, I would not have imposed a, a woman on shortlist in Batley and Spen on this occasion because... We had, for instance, two local male candidates, one of whom was a Muslim, um, who, either of whom would have been a first-class candidate and would go on to to be a first-class MP, but also had a a, a body of support within Mm. the constituency. So uh, I think we have to be much more sensitive and sophisticated about how how and where we use it. And I think the other thing we have to do is not to abuse it. Mm. Labour Party is abusing uh, all women's shortlists um, for a variety of reasons, cronyism for one thing, um, so people with power determining that their friend who they would like to see placed in a seat would have a better chance if there was an old woman shortlist uh, or secondly uh, to stop pers- specific male candidates mm. I'll tell you how we'll stop him getting selected there, we'll make it an old woman shortlist, now you know this is, this is <coughs> uh, undermines mm. the, the principle of a procedure which otherwise, I say, not forever, not in principle, but because we need to overcome the the problem of the paucity of women um, being uh, being selected. Now, the reason why we needed more women is because a, a parliament which doesn't look like the country it represents mm. is a parliament which is becoming less and less relevant. So again that immediately begs questions about, well, all right, if there needs to be more women in it, which there does, then there needs to be much greater diversity in Parliament as well. And we need to be having me- uh, mechanisms, the Labour Party developing these as well, um, uh, around ethnicity, um, but also, I mean, my view, around class. I mean, the Labour Party used each year to be able to, each Parliament, to be able to guarantee 30 or 40 working-class people coming into Parliament by virtue of mining MPs. Well, of course, that doesn't happen now. So, so Parliament, if you're not careful, becomes even more a white, middle-class, male, mm. well-established uh, establishment. Mm. And as I say, what that does is that the, it, it's, a, it's a turn-off for the people we're supposed to be there to represent. Mm, does does yeah. that then lead mm. to, uh, to um, uh, the voters seeing all the three candid- uh, candidates, all the three leaders, as one and the same, and a, a reason why voters are starting to go, for example, towards the Greens, um, because they don't trust the Lib Dems. Um, they see Cameron and Miller as from the same background, the same people. So is that why people are going towards the um, smaller parties or would like to go towards, towards the smaller parties? I don't think so. I think it's true that we have a, an elite in this country... Uh, which um, runs quite a lot of our civic life. Um, so it isn't just Parliament, is it? Yeah. I mean, Oxbridge-educated, middle-class, white, 
men from wealthy families. Um, you know, look look mm. up, um, a lot of the establishments. You know, the medical establishment, the uh, the uh, universities, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, I don't think it's to do with that. I think I think it's what it is. It's to do with is um, in terms of the labour support. It's uh, labour. Um, if you look at Scotland as an example. Why why has the uh, it would appear a vast tranche of labour support swung from what it had stuck with for generations mm. behind another party, the yeah. SNP. And I think it's to do with um, people feeling that that elite is not interested in listening to their concerns and working for them. Mm. What they're interested in is their own careers. And I think, therefore, in the face of the uh, economic situation we've had in this country since the collapse of the Western banking system in 2008 is a situation where the majority of people uh, now work harder for less reward. And yet you see bankers, the bankers who caused it, back to getting million pound Mm. uh, bonuses uh, on top of very fat salaries. Uh, So I think they see an unfair society. I think they see a society where on the same day that uh, the government rewards millionaires with £43,000 extra in tax rebates, Mm. it cuts benefits and increases the bedroom tax. Um, And so uh, I think people see that unfairness uh, and want an alternative Mm. to that. Uh, And the, you know, the major parties appear to be giving a variation on the same answer. I mean, I think... If you look at the Tory party in this present election, they're actually fielding three candidates from the BME community, community and they're, they're selected in safe retirement seats. Uh, and that may be actually making a bit of an impression sort of, uh, you know, within the BME community. Uh, they seem to be doing something about it. Uh, whereas I think, we'd, I'm not sure what uh, the Labour Party situation is nationally, uh, but locally, it doesn't seem to be the same scenario, not just uh, as MPs, but also in the in the local council. Mm. Uh, and something's got to give. Either, like you said, I think uh, uh, looking at sort of more fairer policies. I think we all agree that there needs to be more women MPs in in Parliament. But at the same time, I think there needs to be more uh, of a balanced uh, diversity of uh, MPs in the Parliament. That includes BME mm. uh, parliamentarians. Okay, and now then, I'm and with that. yeah, I mean, uh, we have got questions coming in, but if you do want to send in your questions, um, you can do so on by text or WhatsApp on zero seven four six zero eight zero nine two one eight. We have got the telephone line open as well on zero one nine two four five zero five six two nine. If you want to ask a question, if you want to want to send to, send a message, uh, feel free to do so. Our guest in the studio today is Mr. Mike Wood. Now, then, Mike, um, we're talking about the um, makeup of Parliament a, a short while ago. One of the things we've we've seen. Um, uh, in recent uh, recent years, particularly over the last five years, more so, more so, and more laws coming in against um, terrorism, um, which seem to be uh, or could be seen as victimising the Muslim community. We've had debates on the Muslim veil. We've had um, um, in the Westminster Hall. We've had um, discussions regarding halal uh, meat. It all sounds very anti-Muslim. What's happening down there? Um, well. The war on terror, 9-11, is the backdrop to it. Um, We know that um, this misbegotten attitude to um, some of the problems which we face uh, worldwide um, is the cause of a lot of um, uh, wrong uh, policies. Um, And uh, on a personal level, I have tried to um, do what any one individual backbencher can do in terms of making the argument against um, uh, most of that, Um, voting against it um, whenever it's put to uh, a vote. Um, But we are in uh, this kind of um, uh, period in our history, aren't we, where there has been... I don't remember the world being uh, in a more unsettled... Mm. Uh, condition than it is at present mm. um, and even if you view these as being cyclic um, I think we are in a period of real 
uh, difficulty yeah. uh, and danger, and people get frightened. Uh, and so I think there is a sense in which th- there is a kind of um, uh, wash back from that. Uh, and uh, what I want to see is I want to see Britain having its own foreign policy. I want us to cr- come out from under the shadow of uh, America uh, and have a foreign policy which serves us. Mm. And I think if we were to do that, if we were start to start to realise what our real position in the world is now, that we're not any longer yeah. the uh, power that runs the world, yeah. we're not a, uh, a uh, superpower, um, but we are in that, um, perhaps that second tier of countries with quite a lot of experience which we could use to benefit not just ourselves but quite a lot of the rest of the world if we were to start to make um, our decisions based mm. on not just what suited uh, what suited us but you know according to the best tenets of what it is to be uh, to be mm. British um, so um, in terms of the um, issues like uh, halal meat well the debate was raised by uh, an individual Tory who has a uh, a bee in his bonnet. Um, you have seen there was no uh, vote to uh, mm. uh, to make any uh, changes in in those regards. And so sometimes I think you have to see you know these things. Although yes, it, it, there was a debate and it was uh, uh, it uh, was uh, obviously um, proposed by somebody wanting uh, mm. to make uh, to, to make. Uh, some kind of uh, point uh, which, I mean, he wouldn't I'm sure consider to be uh, anti-Muslim, but nonetheless has, you know, those kind of undertones. Yeah. Um, I, I think you have to see that on the other hand, the action which the, the Parliament's taken in regard to uh, uh, to that particular issue is that uh, it, it remains as it uh, mm. as it was before. I mean, one of the things is people are getting the impression that Parliament is constantly talking about Muslims and where to stop Muslims from everything. Are we going to see a change? I mean, the last five years have been difficult because um, we have seen quite a few of these debates come up. We've seen a lot of, I mean, the, the recent um, uh, sorry, uh, uh, counter-terrorism security bill, um, which has received an, uh, uh, quite an, uh, well, a lot of people are very scared because it is on reasonable suspicion and we know what happened with stop and search on reasonable suspicion. Um, are we likely to see within the next period of, uh, within the next time, within the next five years, of a calming down and starting to see the governments start to engage with wider Muslim communities and try and uh, and and combat uh, radicalism rather than throwing down these um, chest-beating laws? Well, that's the, that's the secret, isn't it? The secret is for, for the political elite to start talking to Muslim communities. Mm. to start working together with Muslim communities um, and instead of always reacting to editorials in the Daily mm-hmm. Mail yeah. um, or to um, trying to outguess Mr Farage, um, which is what politics seems to be um, largely about at, at present, uh, well, in, in, you know, in one sense. That's the, that's the way forward. The way forward is for us to be more confident that... Um, Individual human rights, fair laws, justice for all before uh, before the uh, courts uh, is the way forward. It's a kind of Scandinavian attitude to these things. In Britain, we tend to the, to panic, don't mm. we? Um, but the other element, of course, in Britain is the is the is the power of our secret services, um, and the secret services, as you know. Um, grew like topsy when we were involved in the Cold War uh, with the um, death of the USSR um, left with nothing to do. Um, They then got involved in a lot of um, covert actions against British subjects. Trade unionists uh, were active on a minute-by-minute basis in the miners' strike, for instance. Uh, It's now revealed. Um, And I think that now that's you know, British trade unionism at a, a, a low position, mm. not considered perhaps as much of a threat to the established government. There's all these people with nothing to do. Now, I think what's happened is a lot of that attention has moved to Muslim youth, mm. particularly. Um, and I think what we need is a government that gets a grip of that 
Um, although, don't forget, they have the power to topple governments as well. There was a real effort to get rid of uh, uh, Harold Wilson uh, yeah. by uh, officers in MI5. Um, so without you know, appearing to be paranoid about these things, I think we have to have a government that gets a grip of that. Um, and we do now have more scrutiny of it in Parliament, although via a secret, uh, in our committee that meets in secret, um, but there is now some ostensive scrutiny of it. Uh, but also, more importantly, most importantly, we need a government that um, acknowledges that we have, an, it, we have issues uh, about radicalisation um, and we need to be talking to the Muslim communities who are just as concerned uh, about that. Mm. Um, as anybody else would be if their children were, for instance, being put into a position of being uh, put into a, a position of danger. I have lots of Muslim parents talking to me and have for many years about their concerns about their kids. Yeah. Um, and so what we need is the government, government to be talking to these communities and working together and not just producing ever more um, ridiculous laws um, which make the situation worse. Yeah. Mike, I know you've been a very conscientious MP and you've not been frightened of going against your party policies on many occasions. Uh, and you're you know, very much admired for that uh, locally. Do you think it's been a losing battle? You know, what can a single MP do to change the mindset? Um, yeah. I'm, I'm trying not to bring to mind the, the, the common adage that all political careers end in tears <laughs> because, <laughs> because in essence I don't believe it and I don't believe it about my career uh, and there's only me that can make that judgment I think really and I don't believe it because um, my career was never based on um, advancement and you know climbing up the the greasy pole and what have you. Um, if it had been, then uh, my career would have been a disaster, wouldn't it? And, uh, and we'd all have to admit that. Um, so um, no, I I, th I think because I, I, I if you were to ask me what am I most proud about uh, during my time in Parliament, I'm most proud about two things. One, that we have from day one and literally day one. I got elected, you, you, you started by recounting that you know, in the early hours of the 2nd of May 1997 I was deemed to be the new MP for Batley and Spen. At 11 o'clock that same morning, the phone rang in Tom Myers for the first time and somebody wanted to speak to their MP. Really? <laughs> so, and, so, so from the first day I would want to say that we have tried to provide a service to the whole of the people of Batley and Spen which has been over and above what would normally mm -hmm. be expected. Um, and uh, at, at the time, people who I respected um, in Parliament um, uh, said to me, oh, don't, you know, don't, be, don't be doing all this casework. And s well, you're not a social worker, you're a parliamentarian. Now, by then, I knew 18 people at a time and 20 people were turning up to my surgeries. Mm -hmm. So you think, well, you're the expert, I respect you, you've been doing this job for 20 years, but actually people in Batley's Men appear to want from their MP, amongst other things, because I think most people want everything, don't they? But amongst other things, they want an MP that provides them with help and assistance and advice and support um, through a particular problem. Um, and so I'm proud that we have provided a service, as I say, where... Um, I think the majority of people, and of course, you're, there's always people who you say, "Well, you, you were." I mean, the, the kid, the kid that I met that uh, meeting in Bristol, you're Mike Wood. I am. You're useless, <laughs> you know. And you know, so you're, that's my sister. She thinks you're useless as well. Well, you're always, you know, <laughs> there's 120,000 constituents, so you, you know, you're not going to please everybody all the time. But my, the, the first thing I'm proudest about, if you ask me, uh, is is that we have tried to provide a service, that, and, we're, and we're continuing to, and we should be there until election day, until I can hand the work on to somebody else, whoever that be, um, uh, we continue to do that. Uh, we're then going to spend three weeks sorting the office out and winding up. Uh, that's the first thing. And the second thing is that we've stood for a set of beliefs and values. Mm -hmm. Under a lot of challenge, I can tell you that going down to Parliament every week while we're in government often to vote against your own government, that you work to get elected, that you want to see succeed, but who is apparently determined that they're going to put before you policies which 
are unrecognisable as a policy that should come from, come from a Labour government. Um, and uh, knowing that you're going to have to go into the lobby with your opponents, mm. with, with, a, with a, a large group of Conservatives. I don't find that, I never found that easy. Um, and I have to tell you that the Whip's office make it very difficult. Physically, trying to stop, physically stop it. I've been dragged by the lapels and banged against the wall to stop me going uh, to vote uh, against the government. The physically, you know, standing there, the threats, mm -hmm. the conjolement. Do you want to go to New York to do your Christmas shopping so as to get you out of the way because there was a, a, an important vote coming out? I said, well, no, I'd actually do me, me, uh, uh, me Christmas shopping in Batley, actually. So, you know, no attraction to send me to New York, you know what I mean? So, but I think, so 18 years, and certainly those 13 years at whilst in government, mm -hmm. to try and hold to the belief that you were there, not for yourself, not for the party, but for the people of Batley and Spen, and to do that from a perspective of believing in a different kind of society as a socialist. Um, and of course you fail, and of course there's times when you weaken, and of course there's times when you think, I shouldn't have done that or I shouldn't have voted that way but overall uh, those two things um, to, to be able to say well you know uh, f through the whole 18 years we've tried to um, stick to that that's what I feel uh, mm. proudest about so uh, in terms of you know how that affects the overall position I say I think a lot of these things are cyclic uh, and uh, sometimes parties have to make mistakes and they make them and they go down cul-de-sacs and they go down blind alleys and then they realise and well, you know, I won't make that mistake again. But of course, they do make it again because thirty years later, yeah. as we were saying, Mohammed thirty years ago wasn't you know wasn't uh, uh, old enough to be uh, mm. interested in in politics. And the, the new generation has to some, sometimes has to learn the same the same kind of lessons. Just to go back to that point, mm. you know, as a you know as a Muslim voter, you know, if these policies are being passed through left, right, and centre, even you know, for example, the CTS bill mm. was rushed through like a light mm. flashing, basically, without much discussion. I think. Yeah. So, as a Muslim voter, you know, is there any hope in any of the main parties, you know, the Labour Party or the Tory Party, mm. you know, or should we look elsewhere? Well, I, I think that the the issue about, and I, you know, I, I can't, I can't. Um, mm. uh, give advice to Muslim voters, can I? But f from my perspective, it seems to me that staying within the mainstream is more important for populations that are in the majority than it is for the majority. Because once, you, once you, you're at the margins, you're at the margins, aren't mm. you? Um, and uh, what we know is that across the piece, the policies which have been uh, have been uh, 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 carried out in the last five years have not just been detrimental to Muslims; they've been detrimental to our society, haven't they? Mm -hmm. Muslims still often in the lower um, uh, reaches in terms of the economy and things. So you know, it, it doubly uh, doubly uh, disadvantaged by policies which favour the rich and not and not the poor. Um, but no, I mean, I, Muslims have, it seems to me, the same right and the same responsibility as, as non-Muslims, which is to decide, um, does this party represent the best for me and my family? And then does it represent the best for the mm. country? Uh, and if, if, if Muslims find that the Labour Party doesn't, then they shouldn't vote Labour. My, uh, my conviction is we are still just about the best option um, and we have, I hope, learned some lessons from the last time we were in government. Uh, and I think, as I say, that I think Ed Miliband is a decent, honest man who has more conviction about a fairer society uh, than his predecessor did. Um, and so were he to be the Prime Minister, which I hope he will be um, after May the 7th, I think we will see a Labour government which is perhaps moving back to mm -hmm. um, uh, something more like we would expect historically. And I think on that basis will be better for Muslims as well as uh, non-Muslims. OK, yeah, now then, uh, you are listening to, uh, to Election Special on Radio IMWS. Um, if you do want to send in a text or WhatsApp, so remember we've got Mr. Mike Wood in the studio with us, the uh, Batley, former Batley and Spen MP. Um, uh, the, the number for your text and WhatsApps is 07460809218. And if you want to give the studio a call, it's 01924505629. Uh, now then, Mike, uh, we've got a few messages in. <coughs> 
Uh, what questions? Um, okay, first one is, it would seem the press and politicians are obsessed with jihadists and blaming Muslims and constantly expecting Muslims to condemn acts or all the time. Having been in politics, how do you think Muslims need to tackle this obsession and grow in Muslim blame game? It's impossibly difficult to answer that question, isn't it? Because I think that um, the situation at present is to put people in a position where they almost can't win. Um, so I think Muslims are right to resent constantly being put on the spot every time there is uh, a jihadi incident um, on the basis that all of us are appalled mm. when people are taken out from a university and shot 150 at a time or when 15 Christians are taken and beheaded because they're Christians, etc. We're all appalled by that and, and uh, you don't need to be asked, are you appalled by it? Yeah. Do you denounce it? We all do. Um, um, but um, we've seen this before. We saw this with the Irish. The Irish mm. will tell you that when there were IRA bombs going off in Britain, that every Irish politician who appeared on television was mm. told, was asked the first question: Do you de uh, do you denounce the people who mm. um, you know yeah. set that bomb or killed those people and whatever? So we have seen it before. There's a historical precedent for it. But this, I think, of course, we're, we're dealing with an issue which is more worldwide mm. than. than than the IRA threat to Britain was. Um, so I, I, I don't have any easy answers to yeah. it. I, I think mean, we, we have not to panic. Yeah. Uh, I think we have to kind of work our way through it. But I say we have to work our way through it. The, in Britain, we have to work our way through it by more resort to the proper application of what you would think of as the best aspects of our kind of society. Yeah. Uh, and less recourse to knee-jerk um, uh, immediate legislation and blame games and what have you. Yeah. Um, but in terms of the uh, it, 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 the Muslim community, I, I, you know, I, I, I can't advise the Muslim community, but what I, what I hope is we'll have a government soon that starts talking to Muslim communities and working through these things together instead of trying to, mm. as you say, put every individual Muslim certainly every Muslim spokesperson on the spot mm. to, uh, before any other discussion, uh, to have to, you know, say to... Yeah. Um, so this isn't, isn't that just basically aligning all the Muslims, or uh, the, the Muslim community, Muslim organisation, for example? Yeah. Um, isn't that just aligning them with whatever terror act has happened somewhere else, when there is actually no other link other than the fact that this person identifies themselves as a Muslim, this person identifies themselves as a Muslim? Do you think politicians should, should take a much greater stand um, and for that matter, the media should take a greater stand in actually showing that, no, these are two separate communities in two separate parts of the world. Of, of course, yes. Of course they should, but wh wh whether they will <laughs> is, a, is another issue. For will a, will a Labour government do that? Well, I can't speak... F I mean, I won't even be in Parliament, but I certainly can't speak for the next Labour government. But I say, what I hope is we've learned some lessons um, from a, the last Labour government, which mm. was led by a man who, as we know, believed in um, uh, interve intervening uh, around the world, uh, who believed that he had some kind of messianic um, position uh, to impose mm. uh, Western uh, democracy, so-called, mm. on you know the rest of the world, mm. together with his friend, uh, Mr. Bush. Yep. Um, and uh, so the next Labour government won't be led by people um, with those kind of ideas. And I think, therefore, we ought to see something better from the next Labour government. But, the, but these things are things we have to work at on a daily basis, all of us, don't we? OK. Um, OK. Uh, now then, we've got, um, uh, I think this is more of a statement. It's quite long. But um, hi, Mike. A lot of people who were pro-Labour previously have been left disillusioned by the last Labour government, e.g. Tony Blair. Illegal Iraq war prevents strategy, erosion of civil liberties, disproportionate use of stop and search against BME, introduction of tuition fees. Unfortunately, the current Labour Party have not sufficiently distanced itself from Tony Blair and policies adopted previously. The Labour Party is too, is too far away from the socialist ideals originally that used to drive it. Therefore, I will not be voting Labour and most likely vote, uh, be voting the Green Party this time. Which is something we, uh, we spoke about earlier. It is, yeah. Is that, is that worrying for the Labour Party? 
Well, it should be. I mean, are they taking Labour, note of it? Labour Party should worry on any occasion when people tell it. Yeah. Um, you know, we no longer find you the vehicle for yeah. uh, for um, representing us. Um, and um, I think the Labour Party has distanced itself from uh, a good number of those policies. I mean, uh, um, one of the first things that Miliband did was to suggest that the invasion of Iraq was wrong. Um, now, you know, with, with hindsight, that was hardly a, a, a sort of a crashing observation, was it? Mm. But it was important for the leader of the Labour Party to do that. Um, and I think, you know, across the board, we have, uh, I think, distanced ourselves from quite a lot of the things that we um, apparently thought were exactly right in the period we were in government. But distancing yourselves in, in words is one thing. What people want to see is actions, isn't it? Mm. Uh, and so, um, you know, in a, in a sense, the Labour Party then is in, the, in that position. Well, until we next in government, we can't we can't prove this. But I understand entirely mm. people who say the Labour Party now is too much like the Conservative Party, and therefore, you know, if I want to vote Conservative, I'll vote Conservative. What I want is an alternative to that, um, and the Labour Party certainly has to take note of that. Right. Okay, I've just remembered it's been a long time since we've taken a break. Yes. <laughs> so I think I think we'll take a quick break. You are listening to Radio I Yes, it is the election special on Friday, the third of April. Uh, we have in the studio with us Mr. Mike Wood. If you want to send in a message, uh, text or WhatsApp zero seven four six zero eight zero nine two one eight. And if you want to give us a call, it's zero one nine two four five zero five six two nine. Make it quick. We're not sure exactly what time we're finishing, but it won't be long off yet. Um, we'll be back after this short break. How are you for time? Online and on your home receiver, you're listening to Radio IMWS. If it's around, then we'll get lots of guna. Yeah. It's not even 1% guna, it's like 100%. This is the Kids Zone on sunny Sunday afternoon, mashallah. Isn't it so funny how we all walk around, never even thinking of the day and the down. Come to IMWS, turn right and come into the Kids Zone. Read us a story, tell us a joke, do kirat, and a sheet, a nazam, or a If you get this right, you will be known as the first ever Radio IMWS Sunnah of Sleeping Champions. So don't sleep, a near offer and mugre. MashaAllah. The Kids Zone, every Sunday, 1.30 to 3.30 p.m., only on Radio IMWS. Join the discussion on Radio IMWS every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday from 8 p.m. Topics include Islam, current affairs, health, legal, education and a weekly program delivered in Gujarati. You can join in by calling the studio on 01924-505-629 or send us a text or WhatsApp on 07460-809218. For program schedules, visit www.imws.org.uk. If you would like to volunteer and be part of the Radio IMWS team, email radio at imws.org.uk or call 01924-500-555. Special offer, hire the Al Hikma Halls from Monday to Wednesday for just £28 plus VAT per hall. For more information, call 01924 500555. Bookings need to be a minimum of two hours and need to be booked three weeks in advance. Radio IMWS. Welcome back to Radio IMWS. This election special on Friday night in the studio. We have Mr. Mike Wood. Uh, and Mike, I think we're going to end up um, hiring you um, on the Radio IMWS political correspondent. Um, I think it's be worthwhile. It's an unpaid voluntary job, but never mind. Um, <laughs> yes. now, I suspected it might be. <laughs> <laughs> now, joining us in the studio, we also have Mr. Hassan Badal. Hassan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum And just before we get, we get going again, remember, you can give us a call on all one nine two four five zero five six two nine, or you can send us a text or WhatsApp on zero seven four six zero eight zero nine two one eight. I know Hassan, mashallah, you wish to ask a question. Yeah, I do. Thank you, Mahul. But first of all, can I say the main reason I'm here is to uh, see Mike towards the end. I mean, I was there about five o'clock in the morning on the seventh of May two thousand and ten, and obviously before then I've seen him so many times and in so many capacities. 
doing his casework, including for my family and on various campaigns, particularly the Asian uh, parents' uh, campaign to avoid closure of single-sex schools. And I, ha- I have to say, hand on heart, he has always been absolutely as supportive as we could have possibly hoped yeah. or and expected. So, uh, you know, it's mainly as thanks for that I've come here. Whilst I'm here, I, w- I wouldn't want to be out of character and just go along playing the <laughs> usual <laughs> question and answer. So <laughs> I've kind of, in the break, asked Mike for his permission, if I can ask one or two challenging questions. And first of all, uh, to to kind of pick up on what I think was very interesting, what Mike said, he's going anti-Gordon Brown. Gordon Brown said it's the end of bust and boom. What Mike is saying on a completely different subject is that uh, this uh, kind of voting patterns and support is cyclical. Now, I, I don't know, it made me think because, you know, Mike will know about 100 or so years ago, Labour Party did not exist. And he's also aware of um, all kinds of things, you know, the the, the SNP um, potentially even taking Scotland away and also abroad as well, you know, breakup of the USSR. I'm sure, you know, M- M- Mike has uh, picked up on the fact that apartheid has, has ended as well. So it might not necessarily be cyclical and it could be, you know, something major. So I think... There is a bit of a daunting prospect for, for in the eyes of some people in the sense that uh, uh, irrespective of what we support, there seems to be no positive outcome. And so what I'm wanting to ask Mike is, first of all, are you off your rockers by thinking that this is uh, cyclical? And secondly, does he see, seriously, if he's had a chance to think about it, does he see an end to the first-past-the-post system? Uh, because that could possibly be the only answer to this current Ooh, you know, whatever, um, mumbo-jumbo kind of prospect, prospective situation that might be coming up. Have you considered that there might seriously be a, a near end to first-past-the-post system? And would that be a good thing or a bad thing, Mike? Hassan, thank you very much for those kind words. Um, and um, it was no surprise that they're followed by um, an attempt to, <laughs> to to put me on the spot, and I'm grateful for you coming to uh, you know finding the time to do that. Just to deal with first past the post, which you ended with first. Um, the point about first past the post is that it produces a result uh, where uh, one party is given the mandate uh, to. Um, run this country for the subsequent five years. And so in a sense it's a very clear position and if uh, the party does well then it's clear who we should be thanking. If the party does badly it's quite clear who's responsible. What I fear is if we get rid of first past the post what you mean uh, will be the case then is a constant coalition. Now the problem about coalitions is that no, Mike, to, to be clear, mm-hmm. I thought the alternative might be some kind of PR. Well, well, it, well, well fine, OK, if, that, if, that's the, if that's the alternative. There, there are several alternatives, but either, either way, what PR gives you uh, is um, those people who win your third vote being given the same um, merit as those people who win your first vote, depending on the system that you have. Um, And what you're essentially moving to is a constant coalition. Now, the problem with coalitions is the obvious, which is that um, a party puts its (coughs) mandate forward. Um, You vote for that party. Um, But then what you find is that the two major tenets in that, the two major promises in that mandate, don't appear in the government that uh, actually uh, finally appears to be the government, because the party that came forth, who are helping to form the coalition, won't let the other party carry those out or it won't be in the the coalition. So we have that situation in Scotland where the Scottish system was established essentially so that no one party could could essentially uh, uh, really have a majority. Um, And so the party that comes fourth, not second or third, but fourth, then has almost as much, in fact, in some ways, more power to determine what's going to to happen than the party that came first. And neither of them 
are bound by the mandates they sought by the by the manifesto because of course it's now a, it's now a completely different government now that it seems to me um, is not a better system so first past the post is not perfect but it does allow that that clarity C can i pick um, you up of course you can. before you answer mm. anything else? mike i think from some of the listeners point of view they might you know up and down the country really they might be seeing that the last five years has not really delivered a first past the post system because of this you know uh, conservatives and liberal democrat coalition, well, that a coalition? And, mm. and they also see all the commentators are seeing that that's going to continue probably into the next election and god knows what after that it, the way the makeup is seeing we don't even know how long the U united kingdom as an entity will exist uh, whether it will be forever or, or et cetera, et cetera. So they, they see something like this kind of last government and the next government carrying on for a long, long time. And what that imposes on people's feelings is that what I wanted exactly, in a way, exactly like you've said, the person you were for might become. But it depends on different kinds of representation, alternative pro uh, proportional well, it's, well, it's, representation. Well, it, if it's something mm. simple... Like, uh, you know, you get just one vote. There's, yeah. As you know, there's so many different types. But if it's something simplified, I don't know if there's an example in any other country, but you just get one vote and then you tot it up on a national basis. So the top 3%, and even if you're at the bottom end, the last half percent have voted for Yellow Party, for example, then you get half an MP kind of thing. Um, well, that at would, least that way people will feel that they're putting someone in post that they well, voted. Well, that would break the, that would break the c connection between an individual... MP and their and their would, yeah. uh, and their uh, constituency. Now, it I think would. that's a very important one. I don't want to be on a Labour list that says Labour's entitled to 100 MPs. You're one of them. Go and pick a constituency. I want to go to the people of Batley and Spen and say, I'm the man that wants to represent you. Either vote for me or vote for somebody else. So I wouldn't I wouldn't favour that. Um, and um, don't forget, first past the post on this occasion. 2010 um, produced a coalition but we hadn't had a coalition in this country for 70 years prior to that and that was only because of the wartime um, and uh, lib, lib pact, uh, well we had we, and, we, uh, we, well yes but that that was a short-term agreement within within a, a parliament it wasn't it wasn't the result of an election that produced a result which which so what I'm saying is in answer to your yes but first past the post has produced a coalition um, yes, but my answer is it has only done that once in 70 years. And so I think first past the post, with all its failings, is the best system. None of them are perfect. And every system you choose, whichever form of PR you, you choose, they've all got strengths and weaknesses. I think uh, in total first past the post is the better of those options. Uh, in terms of whether what's happening now in terms of the... Um, draining away of support for the major parties to minority parties, whether that is something more significant than cyclic. Um, of course, there's always the possibility. The, the better example than the one you gave, if I can say, is not that the Labour Party didn't exist. It was formed in 1906, didn't form a government for 20 years after that. Um, but the Liberal Party, of course, before the Labour Party's birth, was the one of the two major parties, and then completely disappeared by the birth of the Labour Party. So, in our own recent history within the Labour Party, we have we have a, 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 an example of if you do not uh, bear in mind what you're there for, if you lose contact with the people you are supposed to represent, they do have options. And like you say, it might not just be cyclic. It might be that, that you are uh, on the way out and, and, and you'll never come back. Now, I'm not suggesting that's, that's possible for um, uh, any of the major parties, uh, or likely for any of the major parties, but it's certainly possible. And, and so we have to take it on board. Very quickly, two, a couple more. Um, Mike, you know I'm a bit of a joker. And, uh, <laughs> in actual fact, I'm a big, big, huge admirer of yours. You know, one of the few Is that people. the first joke? <laughs> <Has> that... <laughs> no, I genuinely mean You know that. I'm a joker. Gen... I'm a fan of yours. The, yeah. people... <laughs> the other two people behind you are another two people <laughs> genuinely in life you. I That's admire. Right. I'll never tell them into the, to the mm. face kind of no. thing. Um, but actually, you know, you're a very 
how can I put it, very fantastic person mm -hmm. in the sense, <laughs> don't laugh. There's a book coming here, I fear. <laughs> no, in the sense that you're well presented. You know, you're not, you're not a Trotsky, you're not a nutcase, you're not picking up the mace. I've hardly ever seen you bad mouth. Well, I have actually, to be fair. I have heard you swear occasionally. <gasps> Very, very occasionally, but in, in private. But you're very presented. You're, you're likable, amenable. You're able to work in conjunction with other people. My one criticism of you would have been that it would have been lovely to have seen you, someone you know, of your background, at the centre of the Labour Party and at the centre of government. Um, why did that not happen, Mike? Politics, Hassan. Politics. We had a... a uh, a uh, Blairite government, and I, I could, I don't imagine, I don't think, uh, and I'm very uh, um, overwhelmed by your compliment, uh, by your compliments. But I'm, com I know enough about myself to know that I have, do not have the talent to have been a government minister. But the first thing you would need to oh, be a government minister, well, th that's my view, but, but, the, but, the, but the first thing you need uh, to be uh, that is, is you need to want it. Now, the problem with that for me is that, that to want it and to enact it, there's a game to be played. Uh, and, and, and the game to be played is around, for instance, collective responsibility. Now, had I been a, uh, in the government... Um, within a month, I'd have had to resign or I'd have been sacked because I attach a certain importance to my conscience. So whatever the collective judgment was within the cabinet or the party or both about, for instance, invading Iraq, I couldn't have voted for it. Well, as soon as you don't, you're no longer in the government, are you? So it would have been a silly, uh, it would have been a silly uh, process anyway. But... If we'd have had a Labour government such as that we'd had previously, where socialist um, ideals were more central... Such as Harold Wilson, Blasphemy, well, uh, would it be, or well, uh, Gordon Brown? Well, uh, uh, Harold, I mean, uh, the, Harold the problem Wilson. is you have to go back uh, almost as far as Harold Wilson, don't you, before, you, before you've... Got, well, not to a, a party with those ideas, but to, to a government. But if it had been a party that was more... Uh, what one would have expected from a Labour Party. Michael Footish. Uh, Michael Footish, perhaps. I, I, would, I would have, I think, apportioned my time more equally between London and here. As it was, I was never going to be in a position where I was doing anything other than rejecting it, opposing it, voting against it. Now, you know, the, and, and that's what I did. But you can't do that and pretend that you're, you know, part of it. Um, and my experience with this job is that, it, as I've said all along, is that there's not one job but two jobs, and they're both full-time jobs. And nobody should try to do two full-time jobs for a long time, should they? Um, a because you know you'll either die in the process or you'll do them both badly. I, before I got elected, had decided that of the priority, I would prioritise the work here. That's why I've always had my staff here. For instance, which I mean, I was totally up. Really. I mean, it means that two million pounds has gone into the local economy over my eighteen years, um, and not gone into London. Now, uh, but it's more importantly, it's meant that you know people have not had to. I remember, you know, when I was uh, a very young man, ringing my MP and speaking to a lady in his office with a very posh accent in London, and feeling as if I'd you know had the audacity to bother the great man. I've had six staff there, you know, with people coming and knocking on the door from nine in the morning till five at night, five days a week, um, right from right from day one. Now, so, but I decided that's that's what I wanted to prioritise, and I don't regret that decision at all. Can I be very unfair, Mike? Of course, you can. One Hassan. of the reasons it wouldn't be you if it, if you weren't. <laughs> one of, and then I'll promise I'll ask, ask my final question, and he doesn't even have to answer. My okay, final so question. so this is the penultimate one. Penultimate, this is the penultimate yeah. one. Penultimate. The reason, Good luck, Mike. The reason. <laughs> I was kind of asking this particular question. I've asked the yes. same to Joe Cox, and in fact, last week I asked the same to Saida Walsi, and right. she said how she didn't want to be represented in Hansard by accrediting that she said this or done that or whatever. But we realistically could be seeing in Batley uh, your successor 
being at the center of politics, center okay. of the Labour Party, and hopefully center of government. Mm -hmm. So that's why I was asking. That's not something mm -hmm. I'm inviting an answer from. That's just mm -hmm. a comment. My final question, which you don't have to answer now, maybe the, the others might want to pick up on it or you might want to answer before you go, mm -hmm. is a very obvious one. Do you have any regrets, both on a personal level, in terms mm -hmm. of what you've achieved or not managed to achieve uh, in, 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 in your term in Parliament? And also in terms of any regrets from the community, before I came to the studio, I was hearing about you congratulating, you know, this facility here, uh, Hikma. And, you know, there's been so many things happening uh, over the last 20 years or so. So whether you'd have any regrets from that sense as well. You don't have to answer now. I'm going to hand over to the other two yeah, colleagues. OK, we've got, a, might want we've to got come back on that. Yeah, well, we have got um, some questions that have come in uh, during the time. Um, let me just see where we are. OK, um, Mike, uh, what do you think of Joe Cox, the Labour, Labour PPC for Batley and Spen? Do you think she will represent us in the same way you have even going against her? Uh, own, uh, sorry, even going against own party policies? Well, uh, that's not really a question I can answer, is it? Uh, uh, jo Cox is the Labour candidate. She has my support. Uh, I said earlier that I think, without taking anything for granted, that we will hold this seat. So within a matter of weeks, Jo Cox will be the MP for Battle Spen. That's, in lots of ways, the easy part. Um, and Jo Cox then has the same responsibility that all MPs have, which is to put the people that she is there to represent before the Labour Party, if necessary, uh, before the Labour government, if we have a Labour government, and before her career. Uh, and um, uh, I have every hope that that's entirely what she'll do. OK. Uh, another question, uh, or rather comment, that's come through. Um, I would like to thank Mike for the work he has put towards supporting the Palestinian cause. Uh, this will not be forgotten. Mike has left a good example for his successor to follow. Thanks, Mike. Mike uh, Palestine has been, uh, I mean, uh, the, the, the uh, message probably uh, is on behalf of <laughs> half the world. <laughs> but um, you have been a strong supporter of Palestine. Um, first of all, thank you very much for that, of course, on behalf of everybody. Um, on, the other, on the second side of it, or the, or the flip side of it, is, is that going to be an issue that's going to be um, moved forward in the coming years? Well, uh, th uh, Palestine needs every bit of help it can get, doesn't it? Um, and we are moving, I think, to a, um, a final chapter in Palestine. Uh, because I think, for instance, in Gaza, by 2020, as we are at mm. present, it will be un uninhabitable. Mm. We've just had Netanyahu re-elected with a surprisingly large majority. Um, we know that Netanyahu has a vision of Israel, uh, which, if it has any place at all within it, for Muslims, for Arabs, for non-Jews, um, it is as lesser citizens, um, which is not terribly far uh, from the apartheid system in South Africa, uh, which I, in my youth, was one of those millions who mm. spent a lot of our energies uh, helping in our own small way to over overturn. Um, now, the Western world has a decision to take, doesn't it? Is it going to see um, the Palestinians pushed into the sea murdered in the same way that they have been periodically. We know as soon as one outbreak of war is over, they're planning for the next one. Yeah. Are we looking for another 5,000, 10,000, 50,000? Are more children going to be uh, uh, left orphaned or killed or maimed continually until, until what? So I, th I, think, I think we are probably in the next five to ten years, literally, that the Western world will have to face it. The good thing is that I think that Israel's position around the world, it was apparent in the last outbreak of violence, much less secure than it has been up until now, and much less secure with the American president. Now, I think that's key, because I think now we have a situation where there is open warfare between Obama and Netanyahu, uh, and I think that is an important watershed. I think it's an important point uh, where uh, we uh, the, where the situation has moved. But 
All we, all we can do in support of the Palestinians is to keep up and increase the pressure um, so that, the, in my view, in the end, the Israeli public has to stop this. Mm. And the, uh, this is what happened in South Africa. There has to be a point where people there who benefit from this wickedness suddenly realise that, if nothing else, you can't get them to realise that it's wrong, get them to realise that it's not in their, their interest, and suddenly it flips over, and you get a situation where uh, you can start to talk about either a two-state solution or a one-state solution uh, where uh, you have equality of citizenship and, uh, and esteem. But at present, we're moving to a situation where I think um, uh, you know, m more violence is, is on, the, uh, on the cards. And we know that um, while countries have a, another country in their, on their landmass, uh, occupying their land, determining what they shall, their movement, determining whether they have a job or not, determining whether they have food, anybody would resist that. In, in, I've said before, in 1940, if Hitler had have come across those 20 miles of the Channel and occupied Britain, my parents would have been resisting it. Mm. We'd, have been the, we'd have been the terrorists, wouldn't we? We'd, mm. we'd, have, we'd have been the ones uh, you know, doing whatever we can against a, a much uh, better armed uh, opponent. So I think the situation in Palestine is terrible, it is unacceptable, but I think the, the West very soon will not be able to... I mean, I think there's a lot of concern in the West, and yeah. I think, they say, the, 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 the Israeli position is lessening, but I think this will move up the agenda by, just by virtue of the fact that Netanyahu will keep pursuing his policy of a greater Israel, um, and uh, the Palestinians will keep resisting. Right, OK. Um, now then, uh, we're going to move over to a local side of yes. things, I think. Uh, we've not really touched uh, much on, uh, yeah. on local issues. Uh, I mean, what I wanted to ask Mike One is... Moment, yeah. yeah, what I wanted to ask Mike is, Mike, what do you think are the biggest challenges facing the next Batley and Spen <laughs> MP? Taking it into the fact that this week we found out that Boots is leaving the town. Um, uh, the mm. library is at risk. Um, <laughs> the market's mm. going. Um, I think it's been extended for another year, but that's going. What, that's just Batley itself, of course. Mm. Sim similar things happening in um, in Clayton with the library and the markets there. Um, what are the big challenges? Well, I mean, those examples you've given locally, which, as you say, are not just true of us, true just about everywhere, mm. certainly yeah. through the north of England, um, are as a result of uh, austerity. Austerity, it seems to me, is a... Um, a economic uh, ploy being used for ideological reasons. The, the present government, including Mr Clegg, although he was spending a lot of last night's debate trying to deny it, uh, believe that there should be a much smaller state. Uh, and the reason for that, of course, is if there's a smaller state, the people they are concerned about, the rich, will do better. All the rest of us will suffer. And, we'll, and we begin to see what that, what that suffering means. If you're, if you're uh, on uh, benefits, your benefits will be cut. Uh, if you're uh, poor and uh, you, are, you have a disability, your support will be cut. If you want to just uh, live your life and educate your children and uh, they want to use the library, the library is going to be cut. Uh, the, as we said earlier, in five years' time with the same policies, there'll be no local government. So... Austerity is the big issue, in my view, um, and it's, say, because it is not a necessity, it has been seen to fail, except for the very small number of people who benefit from a smaller state. Uh, it's not just failed here. Look at it throughout the European Union. It is a failed ideological position. So the next parliament has to throw off that nonsense. Of course we have to pay our debts and eventually the, uh, the deficit that we built up, largely as a result of the economic crisis in 2008, um, uh, has to be uh, met eventually, but not on the backs of the poor. Mm. 
Uh, so I think I think that uh, the the next parliament uh, has to uh, to grapple with that, yep. um, to overturn it, and to start rebuilding our civic society. We we need libraries. The idea that we're going back to a to a position of services as such as we had in the 1930s, which is what yep. the Tory um, uh, policy uh, is is directed to. I mean, yep. willfully, willfully, intentionally, not just this is how it. This is what it will be like. The, this is what they intend. Yeah. Then I think the next, so. The next parliament has to has to overturn that, uh, and we have to start rebuilding our uh, our uh, infrastructures and our, our public services. We have to stop blaming public servants uh, for the ills of uh, the uh, uh, the the bankers. But also, as I said earlier, I, I want to see us have a different foreign policy, and I want us to have a foreign policy which is based on a much closer examination of what our real position in the world is and should be, and a much more um, independent uh, of the United States uh, kind of foreign policy, if only because the United States in 20 years' time will not be the world superpower. So even if we can't do it for the right reasons, mm. we might start thinking, well, it's all right sheltering now with you know, the, yep. the, the superpower. But in 20 years, that's quite obvious. The American pa pa uh, influence in the world is waning. Now, uh, you know, much better uh, for us to have our own foreign policy uh, and uh, where we could make a real contribution uh, to situations like Palestine um, and, uh, and the rest, uh, that rather than always having to defer... Um, to uh, to America. Right, okay. I mean, just to, uh, um, uh, sorry, um, add a sort of question, uh, follow up on that. Um, local government, you've got, you've got your local councils. There's a lot of um, the PPCs, not just one, but most of them are all, all this whole idea, we're going to save the library, we're going to save the hospital, we're going to save everything. How uh, how much can a local MP do on these issues which are being governed at the moment by the council? Um. Well, uh, individual MPs, of course, um, have uh, a leadership role um, to work with others in the, in the local community um, to try and... I mean, for instance, if you look at what we did in regard to DDH, mm. um, we mounted a... together with other groups, not, not, uh, not solely, of course, uh, a campaign which took the decision... Uh, about uh, the proposals from the from the trust, right the way to the Secretary of State. Now, any objective appraisal at that point would have shown that the proposals from the trust were leading to a an unsafe situation in both Dewsbury Hospital and Pinderfields. Now. What didn't happen, of course, is that, that it went to a Secretary of State who was not predisposed to give it an objective view. But So I think that one individual MP within a system where uh, the system is designed to look reasonably and fairly at things can, in situations as important as that, make a contribution. Mm. Um, and um, But in terms of the present reduction uh, through austerity of our local services, uh, as, as you say, um, what's happening is the government is forcing local councils to do its, uh, to do its dirty work um, by, let's say, in Kirkley's terms, £150 million pounds reduction um, so that the council is forced into uh, a position where it will have to reduce and cut and what have you. My only criticism, because it's a totally impossible and invidious position to be in, I was a councillor, I do have some understanding of the position mm. the present council's in, um, is that our council is just a bit too keen to do it in f first order. For instance, if we were to drag our feet a bit, what we're hoping for is, isn't it, is a better days. Mm. If we've got rid of all our libraries in the next two or three years... When money starts to flow again into local government, which you would hope eventually it might, um, be too late. All our libraries will be gone. Whereas yeah. if we could maintain half of them, mm. 
uh, then you know you've got you've got something to build on. Um, so, uh, but uh, overall, yes, of course. What you, what can what can one MP do? Well, one MP can work with its local council to to do as much as we can jointly um, to help to uh, to resist um, what is, uh, I say, uh, a completely uh, invidious and pernicious um, um, plan to. Um, reduce the state, reduce the services, and uh, say, if we have five more years of this, there'll be no councils at all. Okay, and now that we've got a few question, uh, a few messages and questions that's coming from the t- uh, from uh, from our listeners. So, I've been saving these, Mike, because this is the nice, easy run uh, to home. All oh, right, <laughs> <laughs> I thought this was Hassan Mark II. <laughs> no, um, okay, uh, listeners asking, what advice would you leave or give to your successor? I am. Um, um, moving out of Batley and Spen um, at the end of May, um, which is a place I love and which has had an enormous part of my life and will have an enormous part of my heart forever. Why would I do a thing like that? And it's because I believe MPs, when they are the MP for an area, should live in that area. And I've done that. But I think when you're not the MP, you should get out from underfoot. And a large part of that is because my successor, whoever it is, will not want my advice. They will not want me looking over their shoulder. They will not want me saying, I I did it differently or I did it better. Whoever takes over from me will do the job differently. And we want them to do. Hassan Mm. has just predicted that if it's the Labour candidate, she will be much more central to the next Labour government than I have ever been to the the previous one. uh, Well, so be it. There's there's no right way of doing this job. Uh, What you have to do is to keep faith with the people who put you there and every five years put yourself forward for their verdict on whether you've done that in the way that they want and sufficiently well for them to maintain their trust and stay with you for another five years um, and so um, I, I, I will be giving my successor whoever it is no advice whatever um, <laughs> right. and other than to try and enjoy the job because what they're taking on is seven days a week 52 weeks a year mm. treadmill and if you don't get some enjoyment out of it life is very short and uh, I noted that earlier in the in the proceedings you said time flies when you're having fun well i can tell you mohammed that time flies anyway (laughs) (laughs) so so you might as well get some fun out of it and some enjoyment Uh, but i can i can assure them that i've found this to be the most fantastic job in the world Uh, and i'm absolutely envious of them that they're whoever's going to take the job that they're at the start of their career in representing back in Spain and not as I am at the end of mine. Right. Okay. Um, I'm. I'm going to uh, carry on with the with the with the questions here. This is one I was going to ask. Actually, asked towards the end anyway. But uh, a listener sent it in. Uh, Mike, what are the best and worst moments during your time as MP? Um, the best moments, uh, other than the second of early hours, of the second of May, nineteen ninety seven, actually getting elected, um, was I think the occasion in which we won the uh, vote for um, the national minimum wage to introduce it for the first time. Uh, The Tories took us right the way through the night. The the final vote took place at six o'clock in the morning. Um, So we'd been through from two o'clock the previous afternoon right the way through till six o'clock the following morning to win over a House of Commons where the opposition was saying this will cost a million jobs and, uh, you know, this is the end of life as we know it. Uh, and what we know is that actually it's made a massive difference, or did it now, of course, we need it, it's fallen behind and we need to increase it to a living wage. Um, but to establish for the first time uh, in, uh, in Britain a, a, a minimum wage, I had care workers in Batley stopping me in the mm. street, women largely, mm. saying it may it'll make all the difference to my family and thank you mm. very much. It was, it, so I think that was probably mm. the high point. The worst point was the, uh, was the vote on uh, uh, Iraq um, because um, we had mounted uh, a, 
a major campaign, um, both within the Labour Party and outside in the country, as you know, um, at least a million and a half people marching yeah. on the streets. Mm. Um, we won all the arguments. Mm. Uh, we knew we were being lied to and the British people were being lied to. Uh, we knew it would end in tears. We knew it was wrong. We knew it was immoral. Um, and still the elected government um, went ahead and took the, um, uh, took the decision to invade and it's been every much every bit as much a disaster as we forecast it would be. Um, and needless to say, when the recent vote was uh, put before us about restarting to uh, bomb Iraq, um, with all that it might uh, hinder uh, ISIS, and I'm keen to hinder ISIS, um, I voted against because, you know, what I know is that it's all too easy to move to a position of bombing and, f and uh, you know, these terrible use of uh, warfare and weapons. Uh, and uh, it can only be uh, adopted as the very last resort. And what mm -hmm. we've got to, we've got to a position where it's the first resort. And of course, it's because we have a lot of power uh, relative to lots of other countries. We have a lot of armaments and we threaten people uh, and uh, so uh, so that was uh, that was the worst part I immediately got into the car and drove back here through the night um, after the uh, after the vote because I knew I wanted to be here with the people of Batley and Spen as the realization uh, dawned that we were about to um, uh, start the invasion um, so yeah that was a very uh, very low point for me Right, okay. Um, another question, um, similar, but um, okay. I want to thank Mike for all his hard work. Um, uh, only one question what is his biggest regret whilst he was an MP? Um, we're going to change that because uh, what you've mentioned, to more, so like, okay, keep it local. Uh, regrets. Biggest regret well, locally. I don't, I don't have a lot of regrets really. Um, we, uh, you, we, we, you, you're in, I say, the job is, is a treadmill. You're in a situation where really what you're doing is gradually edging forward, edging forward, edging forward, being involved in this campaign, being involved in that, you know, winning some, losing some. The, but I suppose locally, I think the, uh, the fact that the reconfiguration of the uh, hospital trust went through is, the one, or is one of the ones that's got going to have, uh, I think, uh, more implications for the people locally than, than most. I think they say that the trust have established a situation where we have two out of the three hospitals where which are unsafe, and we're now in a position where the services in uh, in uh, Dewsbury are denuded in an area of high medical uh, need, um, and. Uh, it will come home to roost, really. Mm. And I have written more than once to Mr. Eames, the chief executive, to say there are too many hallmarks of the situation here that parallel the situation in Midstaffs. Mm. In fact, when you look at them, there were five warning signs that should have been picked up. Four of them are apparent here on a weekly basis. Now, that concerns me mm. uh, almost when I, whenever yeah. I think about it, yeah. really. Um, so I think if there was one local issue um, that um, uh, <laughs> I feel um, could certainly have gone much better, then that, that, uh, that's certainly it. All right, OK. Um, this is a controversial one, Mike. Um, it's a bit pretty uh, difficult one as well. Uh, hi, Mike. I've always liked your political ideals. However, and when you get a however... <laughs> yes, yeah, there's always... There's always <laughs> yeah. uh, how come being a Lancashire lad, you are supporting a Liverpool FC? <laughs> now, now, this is so obviously from a Man United fan. Absolutely, yes. yes. <laughs> but well, why are you supporting well, Liverpool? Well, actually, of course, I'm not a Lancastrian lad. Uh, oh. so, <laughs> so I'm from Cheshire, and I, I'm in Cheshire, we're very keen not to be thought of as <laughs> Lancastrians. <laughs> I uh, I lived in Liverpool uh, and worked in Liverpool for eighteen months before I came uh, to Batley and Spen um, in for the, uh, when I moved here. First, in fact, I moved from Toxteth 
to Cleckheaton right. uh, in, in terms of culture shocks. They don't yeah. come much bigger than that. Um, and uh, I have always uh, supported uh, Liverpool, uh, I'm, uh, I'm proud to say. My son, my son is, lead, just, is a lead supporter. Yeah, and, they're not doing uh, very well this year, are they, Mike? Uh, <laughs> well, uh, if, if we win on, um, uh, if we win on uh, tomorrow... Uh, against Arsenal, I think we have every chance of ending in the top four. Uh, if we end up in the top four, that would be, I think, much better than anybody could have expected. I think there's more chance of uh, of Valley and Spain getting a green MP, to be honest with you. Um, <laughs> well, I, t- I, I tell you what, I shall come and sit at the back of the studio <laughs> next uh, next Friday uh, and uh, say, I told you so. But obviously, the match tomorrow against Arsenal is, is in a sense, the key match yeah, of the season. Point, isn't it? Uh, and uh, uh, Arsenal, are a, uh, a wonderful side, so. and, and, and I just want to, the cup. And I just want to point out Monday or Tuesday. Yeah. I just want to yeah. point out the Green MP has every every chance in the world. Um, <laughs> Absolutely, um, <laughs> you also support uh, back the Bulldogs, don't you? Well, I, I've always supported Bulldogs. Um, I was uh, vice president for many years and paid for the paid for the privilege. Uh, really? Elected to yes. pay, elected to pay. I wasn't asked to. I paid uh, my. Um, uh, Two hundred and fifty pounds a year to be vice president until the last election, when I have to say the uh, the man who effe- essentially owns Batley Bulldogs um, fated my Tory candidate to yeah, such yeah. an extent mm. that I thought, well, I tell you what, is she going to pay you two hundred and fifty pounds a, <laughs> a year? She isn't, is she? And so I have to say, I haven't paid uh, paid these. Well, I mean, I, I don't think you can keep it out, to be honest. Well, with it, uh, whatever. I think blowing your nose is a political act, so it's <laughs> impossible for me to do. But I just think, I just think that you know, we're, we're, sometimes there are examples of people who don't know who their friends are. But yeah, of course, I support Batley Bull- Bulldogs, and I want to see them um, uh, do well. And over the years, they've had some, you know, cracking people. Um, keeping keeping the uh, keeping the club going, and uh, and, uh, and we, we should all be grateful. Mm. So right. what, well, the other thing we need to see, of course, is more Muslims playing rugby. Yes, um, and uh, we, there's a there's a massive deficit there. Yeah, uh, Batley Bulldogs ought to be one of the clubs taking a lead in that when mm. you consider where its ground is and the, yeah. and the local community. So you have yeah. many cricket presentations locally. I mean, what's your mm. interest in cricket like? Uh, well, my, I, I was always a, a, a cricketer who was so poor that they, they made me uh, wicketkeeper. So I, I, I don't think uh, my, uh, my uh, ability was ever uh, something. It, it, again, it, I determined when I took the job on that I would support and work with everybody I felt was working for the good of Batley and Spen. And so you get involved with a team like Mount Cricket, who for 30 years have been central uh, to uh, the lives of enormous generations of, of young people and provided them with a healthy uh, pastime and uh, being involved in something positive and uh, good. so that's my that's my involvement um, and uh, but in terms of um, sport I'm essentially most interested in uh, in football I have to say. I mean, at 69, you're still quite fit, uh, Mike, uh, really. Mm. What do you do, apart from interest in Liverpool and uh, Rugby I, League? And uh, Well, I, I, I played football all my life, three times a week, until I was into my 40s. And then I had that terrible experience that you hear tell of, where <laughs> I was running across a pitch and felt suddenly as if I was running through treacle. Yeah. And I knew then it was time to hang my boots up. Um, so uh, I have, uh, I, I walk a bit, uh, really. Um, and, uh, and when I retire, I hope to do a bit more of that. Um, but um, really, uh, I haven't taken nearly as much exercise as, as I should have done because, say, if you're working seven days a week. But it's a job, If when you enjoy your work, mm-hmm. it's not like work, is it? We're, as you, mm-hmm. you all know uh, yourselves. And so, uh, but I'm certainly not any great example about fitness and what have you. I'm, I'm probably carrying at least a stone and a half too much. <laughs> <laughs> not right. too much at all. <laughs> I've got one last, um, I want, I, I've got to read this out. I've got, I've, I've got one last um, question from a listener, which is, now that you have hanged your boots up as a, pal- a parliamentarian, yes. what are you going to be up to? I wish I knew, really. I mean, I, I've had uh, some offers uh, okay. and I have some ideas, but I really wanted, firstly, to be clear that I was standing down as the MP and not winding down. Mm. So 
we're intent upon working until election day at full steam. Um, and then we have three weeks to, my staff are redundant, we need to sort that out, uh, and we need to clear the office, tie up all the loose ends and what have you. Um, and so I'm then going away f- on holiday, uh, and I determined that once I came back, I would then look at what being retired means. I have to tell you that I'm not looking forward to it, um, but um, the decision had to be made. Nobody can go on forever. Uh, and uh, so I'm going to have to you know, cope with it and grapple with it, uh, as everybody else does who is lucky enough to get to retirement. Every retiree I meet tells me that they've never been busier. Uh, and no, that's the, very true. And they can't, yes. they can't think how they ever had time for work. <laughs> and so I don't think there's a, di- a difficulty in filling your time. Although one of the things about getting to my great age that, that does appear, you know, does come home to you is time is precious. Um, and so just filling my time is not, is not of any interest to mm. me. I'd like to think that there were things I could do which um, I would feel was you know, worth doing yeah. uh, as a foot soldier uh, no, instead of... Any know, other plans include staying within politics? Is there, well, a, uh, is there a retired socialist group? It's a very small group. You might as well form your own party. <laughs> well, that's right. Uh, there's, a, there's a retired MPs group, <laughs> which Mrs Peacock runs, okay. of course, and I, but whether I shall take part in you that... You might get invite sure. to that. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, and the first problem is that the lapel badge costs £200, so I, well, I'm... <laughs> Whether I shall be able to afford that as a pensioner, I'm not sure. Um, I uh, I think that uh, I say there'll be um, uh, things that uh, that I can uh, get involved in um, and you know find some satisfaction from. Um, but uh, what, what that's going to be, I'm uh, I'm not yet clear. Right. Okay. You're not giving anything away. Well, it, it's it's it, uh, that's the a truthful answer. I, I don't. I, I've. I, Purposely, you, I've decided that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's been the most well, honest I'm, one I've come across. I'm, I'm retiring. I can afford. <laughs> I can afford these luxuries now. Um, I think that uh, I said what I've said is is, is truth. I, I, it's not. I'm not looking forward to it. Yeah. I've had the best job in the world, and so anything that comes after it will be, you know, will find it difficult to follow that. But I will, I'm sure, find something that. Um, uh, Will uh, will actually you know yeah. find meaningful, um, and um, it's um, remains to be seen. Right. Uh, well, there is the uh, as as we put on the table earlier in the show. There is the um, uh, political correspondent that we're looking for, or a cricket commentator. <laughs> um, we'll be happy. Well, yes, <laughs> give me time to think that. Uh, right. Those offers over. Yes. Well, it's, it's a step yeah. up to come up to radio. I know. Yes, from everyone else. So there you go. Um, are you very? Yeah, I think uh, it's been a wonderful uh, having you here, Mike. Uh, really wish you all the very best uh, in your retirement, uh, and I hope we'll see you again in one one way or another. Uh, pros- probably at some k- cricket function. <laughs> yes, um, uh, and and, and but the, being the MP of Batley and Spen, Mike, yes. seems to be quite a long job. But once yes. you're in, absolutely, Elizabeth, Elizabeth Peacock yes. was, of course, eighty-three to ninety-seven. Yes, so right. you've you've uh, beaten her by yes. ninety-seven to two thousand and fifteen. Well, we're following Dr. Broughton, of course, mm, MP for Batley for thirty-five mm. years, was it? Yes. Um, and uh, but of course, following Dr. Broughton is a difficult thing to do, not least because he used to drive around in Rolls Royce. <laughs> now. <laughs> I, I toyed with the idea of driving around Batley and spending a Rolls Royce. So I, I knew then I could not get away with it. But can I just say, um, Ayub and Mohammed, that I've thoroughly enjoyed being here tonight. Thank you very much for allowing me two hours. Um, I've loved this job. And some of the people ringing in have been kind and generous and too generous in terms of thanking me for what, what I've done. What really ought to happen is I should be thanking the people of Batley and Spen for allowing me the honour and the pleasure and the privilege to represent the uh, most wonderful constituency in Parliament. Uh, and uh, so I'm very grateful to have this opportunity so to just say just a curry party you. for them, Mike. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> I'll, I'll, Why I'll, not? That sounds yeah. like a good idea. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, well, I'll, thank I'll, you. I'm <laughs> that's said sincerely. I've, uh, I've loved every minute. And I'm it. sure sincerely, I mean, we've heard a lot of, uh, I mean, we've had a lot of um, uh, important questions as well. We did actually mm-hmm. wonder if today was going to just become a thank you, Mike, yes, evening. But right. we're mm-hmm. very pleased that they have, uh, the, uh, the questions have come in this, sure. uh, this evening. We've sure. heard a lot of people, um, uh, of course, um, 
you are a favored uh, fa- a favorite for many 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 people you are popular you have been I, I can't remember an event I've not bumped into you on to be honest with you um well so the secret Muhammad for me is as an MP, it's when people stop inviting you yeah. that you're in trouble. Mm, yeah. So if people invite me, I, uh, each week uh, as with my secretary, I have a session when I have uh, invitations to look at, my, you know, look at my diary. I often have 20 or 30 for functions in London. I rarely go to more than one or two of those. Uh, every one of the ones that comes in from Batley and Spen, if I can mm. get there, I go. Right. Um, and uh, uh, say it's partly for that selfish reason, I say that, you know, because um, uh, if people invite you, um, then, you know, but it, it's, it's a privilege to be asked to come and share in seeing how people make sense of their lives. Mm. And the good thing about living here and, and, and you know, taking that kind of active uh, approach is that you begin to see the way people are connected. So you see people at school, you see people at work, you see mm. people at the mosque mm. uh, and, say, and you begin to oh that's his brother, oh that's mm. their and now within the Muslim community those kind of, th- kind of realisations are, are fairly s- s- standard and straightforward but in the wider Batley and Spen community that is not the case. Yeah. People often have no, wouldn't know who their cousins were or mm. their nephews or mm. whatever. I mean, it'd be astounding, yeah. I think, for Muslim, uh, uh, Muslims to hear that. Uh, but but uh, for in, a, in a community of 120,000 people, and so you begin to get an idea about how it ticks and how it works. Mm. And that ought to help when you come to make decisions in Parliament about, well, you know, I've got 50 people say vote yes and 50 people say vote no, I have to try and A, within my conscience, to say what's best for that in Spain. Mm. Um, and so the more you know about it, the more you ought to be able to get that kind of decision right. And, you know, when you're taking decisions, votes, I mean, last week we voted four or five times one day, sometimes you vote 12 times, sometimes, you know, that you constantly have to mm. think, well, you know, what, how does this relate to the people who put me here? Mm. So that's, that's why um, uh, I've done that. But also, I mean, I've got you know, enormous fun and satisfaction out of seeing, I mean, groups like Mount Cricket, seeing mm. the way it's grown, seeing the way it's, uh, it serves the, the population and occasionally going and watching the matches and seeing mm. some, some good cricket as well. Right, so, that's brilliant. Now, so shall we finish that now? We will, we will <laughs> just just before we go on thanking each other all night, <laughs> won't we? No, no, just before we do, I think uh, this, uh, I'm glad you said that you've, uh, you go to as many local things because I am going to um, take the opportunity on that one to actually plug Batley Poets. Uh, we're actually right. performing at the Reference Library in Batley on the 18th of April. That's Saturday the 18th of I April. I shall be there. From 1.30pm to 3.30pm. i got the plug in the, on the radio as well for free. Um, so that <laughs> that's that's Batley Poets. We'd love to have you there, of I course, and I'm sure we will be dropping you. Mike? Say again. Do you write any poetry? Uh, I don't write much in Gujarat. This is, this is going to be as many lingual as possible, to be right. honest okay. with you. Perhaps um, you can bring some of your poems along. Uh, <laughs> look, look, we're trying to attract people to it, not to stay away from oh, it. But I shall certainly come on the 18th. We will, be, we will look forward to you. I'm sure we will actually send you an official invite as well. Lovely. Um, uh, but, um, okay, the other thing is, of course, on the 19th of April, Sunday the 19th of April, 6 p.m. here at the Al Hikma Centre, we have got the Batley and Spen Hustings. Um, it's, a, it's an opportunity for members of the public to ask, que- uh, to listen and ask questions of the candidates standing for the Batley and Spence seat. And now confirmed attendees include Joe Cox for Labour, Imtiaz Amin for, con- for the Conservatives, Alex Lukic for UKIP, uh, John Lawson for the Lib Dems. Um, Dr. Ian Bullock um, is going to try and make it. He's working in the hospital. Unfortunately, it is his shift. So, um, uh, we, but um, he might be along towards the end. We might try and sort something out if we can if at all. Um, but that's taking place. That's the hosting taking place on Sunday the 19th of April from 6pm next week we've got in the hot seat we'll be, uh, we've got John Lawson who is the councillor John Lawson who is the uh, Lib Dem candidate for Batley and Spen um, so that'll be interesting um, and are you by anything left to, for you to say? No a big thank you to Mike again for being with us tonight thank you very much for giving up a 
Well, Over two hours, really. Two hours. You could have been at the leaders' debate uh, for that time. <laughs> <laughs> well, this was much more fun. I have to say. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank yeah. You. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. And, and we do hope, yeah. Mike, um, on a genuine note, we do hope that we... Um, I know you're moving out of the area. I read that on uh, the Batley News uh, um, article that you wrote. Um, I, um, but we do hope that you can maintain contact with us and we do hope to continuously invite you back to this show. Um, in future. Thank you, Mohammed. That's very kind. Okay, that's it for us. We will be back in the chair, or I will be back in the chair on Sunday for Kids Zone from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Um, Tuesday, we've got the Islamic Islam program. Wednesday, with Gujarati is back. Mr. Rafiq Dabad has landed. Yes, he went for his trips to India, but he's back and he will be in the chair on Wednesday night with the Gujarati program, inshallah. Uh, Thursday, the current affairs team will be here and on Friday, the election specials with Councillor John Lawson um, for the Lib Dems. And that will be until next week. So from me and everybody in the studio, a good evening and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Online and on your home receiver, you're listening to Radio IMWS. If it's haram, then we'll get lots of guna. Yeah. It's not even 1% guna, it's like 100%. This is the Kids Zone on sunny Sunday afternoon, mashallah. Isn't it so funny how we all walk around? Never even thinking of the day under the ground. Coming to IMWS, turn right and come into the Kids Zone. Read us a story, tell us a joke, do kirat and a sheet, a nazam or guna. If you get this right, you will be known. As the first ever Radio IMWS Sunnah of Sleeping Champions. So don't sleep near Osar and Maghrib. MashaAllah. The Kids Zone, every Sunday, 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Only on Radio IMWS. Join the discussion on Radio IMWS every Tuesday, Wednesday and Thursday from 8 p.m. Topics include Islam, current affairs, health, legal, education and a weekly program delivered in Gujarati. You can join in by calling the studio on 01924 505 629 or send us a text or WhatsApp on 07460 809 218. For program schedules, visit www.imws.org.uk. If you would like to volunteer and be part of the Radio IMWS team, email radio at imws.org.uk or call 01924-500-555. Special offer, hire the Al Hikma Halls from Monday to Wednesday for just £28 plus VAT per hall. For more information, call 01924 500555. Bookings need to be a minimum of two hours and need to be booked three weeks in advance. Radio IMWS.